The next topic we're going to cover are going to be Java monitor objects. And we'll start with an overview of what a monitor is and a monitor object is. And you'll understand what monitors are. And you'll know how Java built-in monitor objects can be used to ensure mutual exclusion and coordination between multiple threads. And I'll also give you a human known use of monitors. So let's start with an overview of what monitors are. So believe it or not, a monitor is a synchronization mechanism that was originally designed back in the early 70s. So this is the original paper by this guy, Per Brinch Hansen, 1973. I thought I would take a look at what else was going on in 1973, because that seemed like an awfully long time ago. And here were the number one hits in 1973. Uh, Elton John was extremely popular. I think I was in maybe sixth grade at the time. I remember listening to, Mike, to Elton John. That's back when he was bald. It was a time when he was bald. And uh, they also, that's when the Sydney Opera House was built. Pretty cool looking structure. So those are, the point is it's a long time ago. These have been around for a long time, one of the early synchronization mechanisms. A monitor provides three capabilities to concurrent programs. The first thing it does is it ensures that only one thread at a time can have mutually exclusive access to a critical section. So that's one of the key things it provides. The next thing it does is it allows threads running in a monitor to block and therefore step out of the monitor while they're waiting for certain conditions to become true. So that's the second thing you can do. So here we had this thread T2 is running and then you know, another thread or t thread T1 can be blocked waiting on some condition, T2 is running and so on. And then a thread can notify one or more other threads that conditions they've been waiting on have been met. So those are sort of the three main things you can do with a monitor. And of course, it's important to recognize that this is covering a, a range of different capabilities. So that's, that's kind of the background. That's what monitors have been doing since the beginning of time, where if time began in 1973. Now, Java provides support for built-in monitor objects. And the thing to remember about Java's monitor objects is they are not necessarily the same thing as the overall concept of a monitor. They're a subset of monitors. And they have some interesting limitations, which is why we have condition objects, by the way. So any object in Java that's not a built-in object, like an int or a double, anything that's not built-in, can be used as a monitor object. And that's because the object class, as we've seen before, defines these methods, wait, notify, and notify all. So everything is, everything is implicitly inherited from object unless it's a built-in. And there are two types of thread synchronization that are supported by these Java monitor objects. One is mutual exclusion, as we talked about before. And that's done through synchronized methods or blocks. And that allows you to mediate concurrent access and updates to shared data uh, structures without race conditions, without incurring race conditions. And the way that that works, of course, is you've got this concept of an entrance queue. And that's what the synchronized methods do. They have an entrance queue. And all Java objects, which are monitor objects, have one and only one so-called intrinsic lock. And those are the ones where you can say things like, synchronize this. That's the intrinsic lock. Okay. Second thing you can do is you can coordinate stuff. And you can make sure that computations run properly in the right order, at the right time, under the right conditions, and so on and so forth. So that's the second thing that Java built-in monitor objects provide. And the way that that works is in addition to the entrance queue, there's also a wait queue. And a Java execution environment, like a Java virtual machine, supports coordination by the wait queue and notification mechanisms. All Java objects have one, and only one, this is important, only one intrinsic condition associated with it. So they have one intrinsic lock and one intrinsic condition. And that's really important to remember. And all the wackiness with Java monitor objects stem from the fact that there's only one condition, one wait queue. These mechanisms that are part of the built-in monitor objects in Java implement a variant of the monitor object pattern. Now, you'll notice if you take a step back and you look at the monitor object pattern, unlike the Java monitor object, you notice Java has one wait queue, one entrance queue. In contrast, a monitor object can have 
a multiplicity of locks or conditions. And that's, of course, again, why Java and the Java, uh, Java util concurrent class libraries have the condition objects to be able to more fully implement the monitor object pattern. But there's a, there's a variant, a, a sort of a stripped down, lightweight version of it that's baked in to Java, the programming language. The intent of the monitor object pattern is to ensure that only one method runs within an object, and it allows a methods, the object's methods to cooperatively schedule their execution sequences. So that's just basically re restating what we talked about before about mutual exclusion and coordination. OK, so let's talk about a human known use of monitors. So one example of a human known use of a monitor would be an operating room in a hospital. So the way that would work kind of looks like this. You're going to have, you're going to try to enter the monitor object, the hospital room. And there's typically a check-in area where you go into a front desk and then they check your insurance card and they make sure that um, you, know, you have insurance and that you're who you say you are, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the check-in. And that's kind of like you know, the lock, right? The, the monitor lock. Then once you get in there, uh, there may be some places where you go for, for pre-op. So you're not actually in the operating room. You're sort of off to the side getting, you know, maybe they're going to mark which arm they're going to work on so they don't end up amputating the wrong arm or, or giving you a, fixing something in the wrong part of your body that's not broken. And then the operating room is where the actual operations take place. And let's say for hygienic purposes, only one patient is allowed in the operating room at a time, right? You could have, maybe you could have multiple doctors, but let's say there's just one doctor for, to keep it can, analogous with our notion of thread. So there's, there's one patient in here. And whenever they reach a point in the operation where they can't continue for whatever reason, you know, they have to, they've done one arm and now they're going to have to let you rest and then do the other arm or something like that, you would go into some kind of waiting room where you would wait uh, and this, this actually might not necessarily be post-operation. It might be you know, in the middle of an operation when they can't make any more progress. They put you in that room, and then they bring somebody else in. But the idea is there's only one patient at a time in the room, and you're there, and you shuffle between these different states, and then when you're done, you can leave. It's not the world's best example, but it at least gives you this notion that there's different places you can be and different ways you can wait for, for service, but there's only one person in the critical section, which is the operating room. OK. So that's the end of the overview part of this.